brings us to our panel today. During the last two conferences, we discussed border policies created by the Trump administration, including MPP, Remain in Mexico, and the Title 42 exclusions. The Biden administration continued enforcing Title 42 for some time and also placed many asylum seekers into regular immigration court removal proceedings. In June, the administration started to pilot new border asylum procedures where asylum officers, rather than immigration judges, make the initial asylum decision. To discuss this new system and to consider other border asylum issues, we have three experts whose bios you can find in the program. So I'll be really brief because I want you to hear from them. Sarah Ramey is the Executive Director of the Migrant Center for Human Rights, located in South Texas. Philip Schrag is the Co-Director of the Center for Applied Legal Studies and the Delaney Family Professor of Public Interest Law here at Georgetown Law. And Jennifer Higgins is the Deputy Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And we're particularly grateful to Jennifer for rescheduling her travel today just to be with, just to join us. She will be leaving as soon as our panel is over. Uh, Sarah, why don't you start off by sharing your knowledge and perspective from the border area? Then we'll hear from Philip and Jennifer. Thank you, Andy, and thank you to Georgetown, to the Migration Policy Institute, and of course to Clinic um, for hosting this event and for inviting us um, to share our experience with working with asylum seekers um, at the southern border. Um, the question that I think is the fundamental underlying question of today, um, at least for this panel, is how do we as a country ensure that we're following our asylum laws, our international treaty obligations, the U.S. Constitution and our fundamental American values um, in the most efficient and humane way possible. Um, unfortunately, I've seen over the last few days in relation to reporting on the flights to Martha Vineyard and other matters, um, a pretty significant misunderstanding of how cases are processed at the border. Um, considering this is also a mixed audience with people varying expertise, um, I wanted to briefly go through the four major types of case processing that we see at the southern border. The first form of case processing is where Customs and Border Patrol will parole individuals into the United States. That basically means they've conducted a background check, determined the person has no criminal history, and um, will issue them a notice to appear in immigration court to determine whether or not they have a legal way of staying in the US. Um, those individuals are often um, pregnant women, in individuals with young children, and others that CBP determines um, are safe to relocate with family and friends here in the US. The second group of people um, are individuals who will be placed in immigration detention. Uh, my organization works with uh, the individuals at the South Texas Ice Processing Center in Pearsall, Texas. We are one of the two pilot locations for the rollout of the administration's new interim final rule, which I'll be discussing in more detail in a minute. Um, the, in 1996, a major immigration reform act was passed known as IRA-IRA or the Legal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. That set up the expedited removal process, which basically says that if someone has been apprehended within 14 days or within 100 miles of the border, they can be removed without seeing an immigration judge. The exception are for people who claim asylum, and those individuals are scheduled to meet with a USCIS asylum officer um, to determine whether they have a credible fear. In other words, a significant possibility of winning their case before an immigration judge. If so, they will be placed, issued a notice to appear and placed in Title um, 240 proceedings. Um, the asylum processing rule that went into force on May 31st of this year specifically changes this process. Um, as we'll be discussing. The two other major policies, as we're all aware, are the MPP policy, where people were told they had to wait in dangerous um, conditions in Mexico for their court hearing, and Title 42, which um, is the same in the sense of you have to wait in Mexico, you're being expelled to Mexico, not necessarily deported, although that has happened in some cases, um, and uh, you will not be given a court date or otherwise be processed through USCIS or any other in any other way have your asylum claim heard. So um, for those of you who read the Washington Post, you probably saw their numbers of um, 
FY22 crossers um, is higher this fiscal year than in the past year. Um, the actual number for Title 42 is 2 million. 300,308. Uh, 300, um, that's the total number of apprehensions. So the actual number of individuals is, um, is about 1,400,000 because these, the, well, this isn't for 2022. Um, the most recent data from CBP is for 2021. The, re the repeat cross rate it has um, increased recently in the last few years, last I would say three years, um, is now hovering around 27% to about one third. And so there are 621,000 people of that group that was reported in the post that are coming for a second or third, or, or in some cases up, up to six times trying to get protection in the United States. So just understand that when you are looking at that number, um, that's not the number of individuals, that's the number that CBP's interacting with individuals. Um, and um, I'll just mention real briefly that MPP cases right now are just over 25,000 that are pending out of a total of about 71,000 um, during the last few years. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna ask you all to do some, uh, um, a little quick thing for me. Um, and I would like you to start counting off just, so I'm gonna, um, ask for this lady in the back corner with the lovely flower dress. Can you say one, and then we'll just go one, two, three, down the row? One, two, three, four, five, six, okay, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to, for the folks that are virtual, we'll pretend like they're 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. 46, 47, 48. Those are the people in the last couple months who would have been granted protection in the United States, but for the implementation of the new interim final rule according to USCIS statistics. Um, so that represents 11% uh, reversal rate of negative credible fear interviews that are no longer able to happen because of the time limitations that have been implemented. So I will explain how this happens um, in the next few slides. Um, so USCIS released uh, publicly uh, the first data set at the end of last month. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the positive credible fear findings and the negative credible fear finding numbers. And we have this here on our next slide. Um, so we're looking at a denial rate of credible fear interviews of 47.5%. Um, in the reporting period. Now, these include cases where the immigration judge has disagreed with the negative result and has reversed. So the actual CFI denial rate is probably significantly higher than this. I'm, I, um, I haven't been able to do the math, but I'm guessing it's probably about closer to 60%. Um, the denial rate across the board, not for IFR cases, um, is also fairly high it, during that reporting period. Um, and that's at 42%, but it is, so it is lower, but it's still high. And, and you can tell that because if you look at the regular CFI denial rates for the last two years, uh, it's significantly lower. Uh, so you, this, I think, chart very adequately <laughs> shows that in the last, you know, these are just, this is just under the Biden administration, right? So first year Biden administration, kind of second year Biden administration, we are seeing a huge increase in denials. Um, I will say, it's very unclear in practice why this is happening because I haven't noticed any significant change in how the case, who's coming or necessarily how the cases are being processed um, beyond, beyond this new rule. So, um, you know, the Houston Asylum Office that hears cases at our facility as well as the Houston um, contract detention facility, the other pilot site is um, around 60%, this is, this is data from the beginning of the year. Um, this is the latest data we have to compare nationally. And the national rate, of course, is um, much higher at 82%. Um, and hu Human Rights First issued a report recently last week uh, explaining that there were some um, concerns with how those interviews were being conducted. Um, the issue with the credible fear interviews, why they're so important, one, is when you get a positive result that's now being treated as an asylum application, basically sworn under oath, that's going to form the basis of your request with the immigration judge um, if, if you're not approved by the asylum office at asylum merits hearing. 
So any errors in the interview that's where they you would still get a positive um, could come back and present credibility issues. And um, I have seen those result in denials with the judge. And then of course, erroneous denials um, would result in people being uh, forcibly returned when they are bona fide refugees, like the 48 people that we estimate um, have been deported in the last couple of months due to the interim final rule. 99% um, of asylum seekers do not have counsel. Um, your chances of winning protection in immigration court increase fivefold if you are represented. And uh, the you know, importance of counsel in understanding the laws and the process can't be understated. Um, and so the, the, there's various reasons why it's difficult to get counsel and why people have problems um, presenting their stories to a, an asylum officer. Um, these interviews take place often um, within a span of about two weeks, sometimes less, which does not give folks the opportunity sometimes to find much less um, hire someone. Um, the pro bono list that's provided to individuals is in English, um, especially for non-Spanish speakers. So we're Creole speakers, Lingala speakers, they often sometimes go months or longer without being able to talk to anybody because nobody speaks their language. Um, and then the meeting circumstances can be very difficult. So attorneys you know, may not want to travel several hours to meet with someone. Video visitations are limited to two per day of what, one hour per person. Um, there's a lack of confidentiality if they call from the dorms. There's issues with them not having free phone calls. Um, and so there, in, a, in addition to this, you know, if you know if you if you think you've just survived some traumatic experience and you're you're trying to worry about paying your electric bill like that's the last thing on the top of your head right so a lot of times also because of the being in detention the stress the anxiety the trauma it makes it very difficult for people to be proactive and figure all this out immediately because nobody's told them they need to right um there and then you know the other issue is that people really do think that the US is going to protect them um, they say, my life is in serious danger, the U.S. stands for human rights, that's enough. And I can tell you it's not, because our laws are much more complicated um, than, than one might think. Um, so uh, to give a, a few examples of issues um, that people have when they are not represented, um, sometimes they don't feel like they have the ability to stand up to an officer and correct them if they say a mistake. Um, they often... Um, will not tell their story in chronological order. They'll start with what's most important to them and they move around the story and that gets confusing for the officers and things get skipped because of that. Um, they don't give certain details that can be very crucial. So in the example um, that I give to people, I talk to them, you know, the, the person got a positive CFI. They said they talked to their mom a year ago and then when they got to the judge, they said they talked to their mom six months ago and the judge said, what's, well, what's going on? You're lying to me or you're lying to the officer. And, and that was the end of the story and they were denied. And the situation was the person just didn't say, well, I talked to my mom in person a year ago when I was in my country. And the last time I talked to her by phone was six months ago before I crossed the border and got put in detention. And so just those little lacks of detail create huge problems for people. Um, there's cultural differences where people might feel uncomfortable, like it's inappropriate to say certain things. And then there's a lot of concern, especially um, recently with folks who are fleeing from dictatorships in Nicaragua, Venezuela, et cetera that reporting to a government office or some of like problems against another government, um, that, that information wouldn't necessarily be kept confidential. And because their interactions with their corrupt police officers and their corrupt officials is not the same um, as what it would be here, but they, you know, they just don't have that level of confidence. Um, so what, you know, so what is the result of this? Well, it, there is a review process with an immigration judge, and you can see in the last couple of years that the ability of, uh, or the number, I should say, of judges re reversing C um, negative CFIs has actually increased. So we're seeing an increase in denials, and we're also seeing an increase of judges saying, hey, that's, the, that's inc an incorrect decision. Um, you know, the reality is, I think by and large, in my interactions with USCIS, um, the officers are trying to do a good job, but they're also human beings and they're valuable. Right. So when I'm meeting with somebody, you know, the first time I meet with them, I don't get the full story. Right. I'll get the full story later on um, after meeting with them second time or third time and the tr where the trust is built. And I go, oh, wait, I forgot that question. Um, this is really important for us to talk about in more detail. So um, the IGs are reversing about 32 percent of the time. Um, and, you know, this is important checks and balance system. 
um, our, you know, issue here is are the immigration judges always correct? And we know that they aren't, otherwise we wouldn't have a Board of Immigration Appeals, federal courts, and the Supreme Court ultimately to look at cases. Um, so the uh, asylum, um, Um, so the new interim final processing rule has limited the request for reconsideration process to seven days um, and is only allowing one of those requests. So if an individual filed a letter pro se, as an attorney, I wouldn't be able to go back and look at that um, case. Um, and the, you know, the issues with the IJ reviews are very similar to the issues that you have at the CFI. They're a very, it's a very quick process um, and people don't have sort of the ability to, if they're unrepresented, um, to fully explain their case in many situations. Um, I'm going to skip the examples here, but I'm happy to talk about more specific issues in Q&A. Um, but in the interest of time, um, I do want to just show you some data, a, few, a couple data points that we have. So this is what we've tracked in the last couple months of how long it takes us to get a copy of the file. So this isn't even consulting with somebody or preparing a request for reconsideration. Um, so the only cases where we potentially meet that seven day deadline are in this very first column, right? The vast majority of people, we don't even have a file to review until after the seven days have gone by. And then from the time we get that file to when we consult with them, um, depending on if we do in-house or if we're looking for and referring out to pro bono um, also varies. And then this is sort of the total of those two combined. Um, so, you know, we have tracked that, like, we're looking at about a 25% rate of people getting deported before we're even able to talk to them um, or otherwise get a letter prepared for them. Um, so I'm going to end there and I'm happy to take any questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Professor Schrag, would you now share with us what you've learned from your study of the new border asylum system. Thank you, Andy. So when it created this new asylum processing system under the new interim final rule on asylum adjudication in expedited removal cases, the administration claimed that the purpose was to create a new system that was both fair and efficient compared to the current system or the system before last June with people waiting more than four years for a hearing in the backlogged immigration court system. Many aspects of the new system are laudable. There are some wonderful things about it. Basically, the idea of having asylum officers rather than immigration judges adjudicating asylum claims in the first instance is a terrific idea. It's a, a less expensive procedure for everybody involved and appearing in a non-adversarial uh, asylum office interview is a lot less terrifying than appearing before a judge in robes. There are other good aspects of the system too. Uh, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, isn't detaining the people in the new system. And it's virtually impossible to prepare a good asylum case from detention. The new system eliminates the need for applicants for asylum to file a complicated asylum application because a positive credible fear determination is deemed to be an asylum application. There is no one year deadline problem for people in the new process because the asylum application now uh, being deemed by this process to be the positive credible fear determination happens within a few days or weeks of crossing the border, so there's no one-year deadline problem. Uh, at the asylum office interviews that follow, interpreters are provided at government expense, which is a, uh, a good reform compared to uh, the affirmative asylum process in which people have to bring their own interpreters. Asylum officers are now going to be allowed to make findings on eligibility for withholding of removal and torture convention protection. But the new system has one dreadful flaw in it. And that's what I want to focus on because that's what makes it unfair, even though it's, un, even though it's efficient. And this is a flaw that I hope will be corrected in the final rule when it's finally adopted. The dreadful flaw is the very short, excessively short time limits, which prevent asylum seekers from being able to collect the corroborating evidence that they need to win their cases. So what's the schedule? A merits interview with an asylum officer must be held 21 to 45 days 
after an asylum applicant is notified that she's been determined to have credible fear of persecution. And the supporting evidence for that application for asylum must be filed seven days before the asylum merits interview with the asylum officer or 10 days if by mail. Well, most applicants are gonna file by mail because they're not necessarily gonna be in the same city even as the asylum office to which they will have to report. So if the interview is scheduled 21 days after notification, the evidence is due 11 days after the credible fear notification. If it takes the applicant two days to get released from detention after this notification and two days to reach their destination by bus, wherever they're going in the United States, to where the interview is going to be held, that leaves only seven days to collect the evidence. And most applicants will need corroborating evidence because of the Real ID Act, which says, quote, where the trier of fact determines that the applicant should provide evidence that corroborates otherwise credible testimony, such evidence must be provided unless the applicant does not have the evidence and could not reasonably obtain the evidence. So what is what are we talking about? Co collecting corroborating evidence usually requires the assistance of counsel. But many, if not most, asylum applicants will take weeks to get settled in their new location with a friend or a relative, and many more weeks to obtain pro, bo pro bono counsel. Almost all organizations that provide pro bono lawyers have long waiting lists and take weeks to provide uh, assistance if they're going to at all. When an asylum applicant is lucky enough to find a lawyer, it will often take the lawyer several months to collect the corroborating evidence. To understand why months are necessary, we need to look at the kind of corroborating evidence that they collect. To begin with, sworn witness declarations from people in the applicant's home country who know what happened to the applicant are usually uh, desirable. That is, from people who visited the applicant during detention by detention by persecuting authorities, people who bribed prison officials to let the applicant escape, or in the case of beatings or rapes by government officials or non-government actors, people who tended to the victims after these events. These affidavits are critical evidence, critical corroborating evidence to applicant stories. But these witnesses are themselves often afraid to provide statements, and weeks may be necessary by, for the applicant and the counsel of the applicant to persuade them to cooperate. These witnesses often don't speak English and an interpreter has to be found. Because electronic or written communications may be intercepted by persecuting governments, witnesses have to be instructed how to use encrypted communication methods. Besides witness statements, applicants should have documents to prove their cases. They should have arrest records or jail records or police reports to show that they were persecuted. They will need identity documents, such as birth certificates, if they arrived at the border without a passport, which is a lot of, for a lot of people, true. They will need medical records if they received care after being beaten or otherwise tortured. Sometimes they will need medical examinations or x-rays in the United States to prove that their bones or teeth were broken during persecution. Getting low cost or no cost medical exams for uninsured foreign nationals can alone take several weeks. Similarly, psychological examinations can often show post-traumatic uh, uh, stress disorders or severe depression associated with persecution and obtaining free psychological examinations requires a, a lot of time because of the overburdened psychologists who are willing to do this kind of work. For country conditions that corroborate the story, published human rights reports often describe a country's general uh, practices, but corroboration of details that corroborate the specific things that happen to an asylum seeker is much more difficult and often requires expert testimony, such as information about conditions in a particular police station in which the applicant was confined or the treatment of gay and lesbian individuals in the particular village in which the applicant was attacked, or the prevalence of genital cutting in a remote region of a country that has officially banned the practice. All of this requires expert testimony, and almost none of it can be obtained, even by a represented asylum seeker in seven days, or even in the five weeks between a positive credible fear determination and the longest time for a merits interview. If an asylum officer does not grant the claim because of the lack of this corroborating evidence, the applicant is referred to an immigration court for a hearing, 
within, again, an accelerated time frame. The initial scheduling hearing has to be held within 30 days after the referral and a further hearing 30 days after that. And the corroborating evidence in the immigration court is due at that second hearing, 60 days after the referral takes place. Even that 60 day period is too short, particularly for applicants who are unable to secure counsel until after the asylum office interview has taken place. How much time would be enough? Well, in our clinic here at Georgetown, we're able to collect sufficient corroboration in about four months. But those four months start after we accept the case. Our clients usually have been bounced around among other pro bono organizations with long waiting lists for weeks or months before they get to us. Furthermore, our caseload is unusually low because our primary mission is education. Students work in pairs and spend full time for a semester in our clinic handling just one case. Lawyers with caseloads of 50 or 75 cases at a time can't spend nearly the amount of time collecting evidence for each case as we do. So in my personal estimation, for this new system to work, and it can work and it can be fair, asylum applicants should be given at least five or six months before the merits interview with the asylum officer. That may seem like a long time compared with 21 days, but it's very short compared with the four years that it now takes to get adjudication. The initial statistics that have emerged from the process are unsurprising in view of the very short time for merits interviews. Of the first 329 individuals who have been scheduled for merits interviews in an asylum office, only nine of the 329 had legal representatives. 76 of those cases have had decisions so far, 52 of them were not granted asylum, so the grant rate was 31.5%, not out of line with the grant rate for affirmative cases generally. But of the 52 people who were turned down, only one had a representative, one person out of 52 people who were turned down in their applications, while a quarter of the 24 people who were granted had representatives. There's no way to know whether a 31.5% grant rate is too high or too low. I have no opinion on that. But keep in mind that all of these individuals had already been found to have a significant chance of winning asylum, a credible fear of persecution. And many studies have shown that a legal representative makes a huge difference in the chance of prevailing in an asylum case. Now, if the Department of Homeland Security is unwilling to increase significantly the time for an applicant to obtain counsel, and for counsel to collect corroboration that's required by the Real ID Act, there is one other thing that the Homeland Security Department and the Department of Justice could do to avoid stacking the deck against these individuals. Recall, I read the, you the, pre, the Real ID Act, recall it does not require corroboration if the applicant does not have the evidence and could not reasonably obtain the evidence. So if the Homeland Security Department is unwilling to extend the time five or six months from 21 to 45 days, it should instruct its asylum officers that in cases under the new system, because of the short time period imposed, applicants cannot reasonably obtain corroborating evidence if they did not bring it to the border, and almost nobody brings it to the border. Therefore, if these instructions were given to asylum officers, the Real ID Act would no longer stand in the way of asylum for these asylum seekers. They could win relief on the basis of their credible testimony alone. Thank you. Spontaneous reactions, huh? <laughs> was it because he's a professor? Is that what this is about? Thank you very much, Phil. I didn't even have to pass the two minute note, did you? <laughs> um, Seriously, thank you, Phil, for sharing that with us. So Jennifer, we would now be grateful if you would share with us your knowledge and perspective regarding this new system and any other border asylum issue that you'd like to help our audience understand. Definitely, thank you so much. And thank you, um, Andy, for convening this panel and to MPI and clinic and the Georgetown Law Center for being able to pull this together. I have to say, I am thrilled to be on the panel with these two very distinguished guests um, and with you, Mr. Schoenholtz. Uh, I 
I think it's so valuable to bring folks together to talk about these issues. My only regret is I do have to catch a plane after this because I would really love to spend a little more time digging into some of the things that we've just discussed. But I, I think Sarah, you and I have already agreed to do that. So, um, so I really appreciate hearing these per perspectives and, and hopefully um, I can provide a little bit of a perspective from um, the government side of the house and the operational side of the house. It's, it's really interesting to actually be here today to talk about this issue because, um, you know, a, a few, several years ago, actually probably more like a decade and a half ago, I remember being an asylum officer and talking about this concept, this idea that an asylum officer would be able to grant protection in the first instance at the border. Um, and of course, you know, the, Many folks have talked about this principle and this concept uh, for, for many years. And many people in this room, many of the experts in this room have, have perhaps even recommended going down a similar path. Um, so it's, it's interesting to be able to be here today and talk through some of this. Um, that being said, I fully recognize <laughs> that the current version of the interim final rule, while it may uh, reflect that core principle of having an asylum officer making a decision in the first instance. It doesn't necessarily fully align in terms of how it's been implemented in practice um, with some of those other recommendations that folks have had. Um, but, you know, the thinking remains the same. The idea and concept behind the rule is that we can leverage the training and experience of asylum officers and have a non-adversarial setting in the first instance, that hopefully we can leverage efficiencies by ensuring and eliminating the need for all asylum officers to have to go in front of an immigration court. People can get protection earlier and people can get a decision regardless of whether it is favorable or a decision to remove more timely. So I thought I would spend a little bit of time just kind of talking through the process and how the rule is being implemented in practice. Um, but I really look forward to getting into some of what I imagine are gonna be some really great questions. So I'm, hopefully I, I won't go over time. Um, so I think as most of you know, we have implemented the rule in what we're calling a phased implementation approach. And so what that means is that we are starting small. So CBP and ICE have initially identified a few hundred credible fear referrals per month as potential asylum merit interview cases, or as we call them, AMI cases, because we are the federal government after all and have to have an acronym for everything. Um, the goal, of course, is that we would increase the number of referrals increment incrementally as our capacity expands. But starting small allows us to talk through some of the issues that you've been hearing from my other panelists and think through how we want to address some of those things in the final rule or in our operational implementation. So for the initial phase, uh, we have been processing approximately 500 detained single adults per month uh, have been referred to USCIS for processing under the rule. Um, since then, we've increased a little bit to 750 referrals per month. And in, in determining which cases are actually referred for asylum IFR processing, um, the government is looking at a couple of things. First, and this is really critically important, the destination location of the asylum seeker. The reason this is important is because we wanted to ensure that we were starting out in locations where DOJ has legal orientational programs in place. Um, of course, they also have to be co-located with a USCIS asylum office and your immigration court. And these inclu locations include Boston, Los Angeles, Miami, Newark, New York, San Francisco, and we recently added Chicago in August. Second, um, we are looking to determine whether the migrant appears to be amenable to release following a, a positive credible fear determination. In starting small, and as Sarah mentioned, um, the first locations we were starting were with individuals who were single adults and who were detained. Third, we are looking at whether the asylum seeker can be interviewed in English, which is rare, um, or one of the 47 USCIS contract interpreter languages. In fact, when we started the rule, we were getting a lot of referrals of Turkish applicants. And while that is one of the contract interpreter languages, um, we did not have enough capacity in the interpreter field to be able to, to continue processing those large number of 
of, of Turkish cases. Um, so we're being flexible with the, the types of cases that are getting referred. Provided all those criteria are met, after a positive credible, credible fear determination, the asylum seeker is released from detention and placed on an alternative to detention, so ATD, um, which is essentially a SmartLink telephone app. And I would just note that at the credible fear stage of the process, it's very similar um, to what it was prior to the implementation of the rule. Um, the standard is the same. I can't remember who mentioned it here, but significant possibility of being able to, uh, to achieve asylum in, in um, uh, a full asylum claim. So what is different is that upon a positive finding, rather than getting an NTA uh, and going to an immigration judge, um, as Mr. Schrag said, the individual is scheduled for an interview with an, an asylum officer. And that's really important because it's a non-adversarial interview. Um, at the same time, they receive detailed documentation about what to expect uh, in terms of that asylum merits interview. So they get a fact sheet, which includes the time, the date, the location of the interview, information on how to prepare for the AMI, instructions for rescheduling an AMI, and submitting additional evidence, um, and the consequences for failure to appear for the interview. The goal of the documents is to help ensure that applicants understand the process and help support their compliance uh, with the next step. And of course, that next step is meeting with an especially trained asylum officer. Um, Importantly, the asylum application, I, I think it's interesting because we kind of heard two perspectives. One perspective that allowing the written record of the positive, positive credible fear determination to serve as the asylum application is both a positive, um, but also challenging. Um, you know, Sarah raised some, some very good and interesting points about using that written, written record as the asylum application. Um, but under the purposes of the rule, we are using that written record as the asylum application, and we are able to reuse the biometrics that were captured previously as part of the border process for background check purposes. That means the individual does not need to fill out an asylum application and submit it, and it also means they don't have to go to an application support center for a biometric uh, capture. So the date that the applicant is served with the written record of the positive credible fear determination is considered the filing date and receipt date for the asylum application. And as you've heard, the asylum merits interview is scheduled to take place no earlier than 21 days after the filing, but no later than 45 days after the filing, absent exigent circumstances such as the applicant illness. Um, all AMI interviews are conducted by asylum officers um, and a new specialized core of asylum officers, which um, ensures that we are we have our most seasoned staff doing this work. These are higher graded positions um, at both the asylum officer and the supervisory level. And it, I think that just really reflects what we understand to be the complexity and sensitivity of this new workload. We currently have 175 staff on board, um, and uh, when we're fully staffed, we expect to have just over 200. I would just share that by comparison in the FY23 president's budget, USCIS did request $375 million, including payroll for 2,000 positions to support expansion of the rule. So that gives you a sense of the small scale that we're really starting with in this first phase. Um, the other thing I will just point out in light of some of the comments from my, my colleagues on the panel is I think it's really important, the, the um, points that are being made about access to counsel and representation. But I also think it's really important to reiterate the non-adversarial nature of the work that the asylum officers do and also the extensive training they get. So these asylum officers not only are very seasoned and have been doing this work for some time and have all the foundational um, specialized training to be an asylum officer, but this new cadre has an additional two weeks of training. And at the very core of that training is a deep understanding that the officer's job is to elicit information. 
That is their job, to be able to provide every opportunity for the individual that they're meeting with to state their case, to ask those follow-up questions and clarifications if something is sounding um, strange or is inconsistent with something that's said in the past, making sure they're taking into consideration um, those cultural uh, issues that, that Sarah touched on. That's not to say that the process is perfect. These officers are human beings after all. Um, but I do think it is really important to share that these officers at their very core know that their job is to gather as much information as possible so that they can get to the right decision. Um, like affirmative asylum cases, the asylum officer's decision in the AMI interview is generally served on the applicant in person two weeks after the interview takes place. And all of these decisions undergo supervisory review before they're finalized. And we also, just like we do with our regular asylum cases, uh, do period, periodic quality assurance review checks as well. So as outlined in the rule, AMI adjudications are expected to be completed within that 60-day time, time frame of the filing date. Um, and as a reminder, that's the date of the positive credible fear determination. And applicants who are found eligible are issued a final grant of asylum. They're authorized in, to work incident to status. They're eligible for certain benefits. And, and of course, they can apply for a green card one year after the asylum approval and are eligible to be able to file for their immediate family members. If an applicant is found ineligible for asylum, the asylum officer also assesses whether that individual has demonstrated eligibility for statutory withholding of removal or withholding or deferral of removal under CAT, Convention Against Torture. And while asylum officers can't grant that withholding or deferral of removal under CAT, their assessment is considered by the immigration judge when it is referred. If USCIS doesn't grant the case, uh, then the, that full package um, is sent to the immigration court for streamlined 240 removal proceedings with the master calendar hearing being scheduled within uh, 30 to 35 days from the service of the notice to appear. And under the rule, unlike traditional affirmative asylum interviews, all asylum merit interviews are recorded. So the referrals to the immigration court include a complete transcript as part of the record of proceeding that served on the court, the applicant and the applicant's attorney. The transcript is, is one of the key parts of the process that actually facilitates the expeditious adjudication of the case by your under the new streamlined proceedings. So that's sort of the end-to-end -end process. Now the numbers, you've heard a, a few of them, but I'll, I'll highlight and reiterate a few here. Hopefully you all have seen that our Office of Immigration Statistics recently published data on the rules implementation. So you all can access it firsthand and take a look. Um, it's covering the first 75 days of the rule being in, to, in effect. So from June 1st through August 15th, uh, and we'll be refreshing that data periodically. And if you dig into the statistics on the website, you will find that we've been able to successfully process cases within the timeframes that are outlined in the rule. Um, a few key stats. So the median processing time for AMI cases has been 40 days from filing, well within that 60 day requirement in the IFR. 24 applicants have been granted asylum and 52 cases are now in streamlined removal proceedings. The immigration courts are just a few weeks into the first of these cases, um, so we have to wait a bit until uh, we can have sort of meaningful data on the, on the uh, IJ side of the house. I think what these preliminary results reflect is that the rule process does seem to be achieving uh, the primary goal, which is to create an efficient process, um, albeit on a small scale. I actually had the opportunity to observe an asylum merits interview recently, and I really think another key aspect of the rule that's very positive is that it really is leveraging the expertise and experience of these asylum officers um, to be able to adjudicate these cases in the first instant. I was so impressed with the rigor and thought that the officer put in to the entire interview and every aspect of it. Um, they're very lengthy, uh, but again, that goes back to that officer's duty to elicit information. 
That said, we absolutely recognize, <laughs> as my panelists have shared, that this is taking a process and streamlining it, a process that used to take multiple years and streamlining it down into months. That's why these panels are so important. That's why it's so important that we're able to connect and coordinate with NGOs, practitioners, getting information on what's working, what's not, what are the unintended consequences, and taking those things into consideration. We already did it at the at the um, comment stage of the rule, right? There was an there was a part of the rule that actually had asylum officers issuing removal orders based on comments and feedback. We modified that to mo move to a 240 streamlined process. Um, we really look forward to hearing more about some of the concerns, some of the ideas that you all have for improving on this rule, because I will say that I think at its very heart, there's a lot of good in this rule, in the concepts and the principles, and I see glimmers of success in how this rule is being implemented and look very much forward to answering your questions and, and also hearing more, hearing more from my panelists. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Appreciate you walking through the process carefully so everybody has a sense of how it actually works. And perhaps that helps you integrate the other panelists' remarks as well. So we're going to open it up for questions. Please, if you're here physically, come to the microphone. When you do have a question, I would like you to identify yourself so our panelists know who you are. If you're with an organization, let us know that as well. Um, and we also have questions from, the, uh, from our virtual audience uh, at, uh, in, ad in addition. So let me allow our first questioner here physically and i'm going to go back and forth with our virtual audience because i want them engaged as well go right ahead uh, is it working one one of them will we promise here we go thank you so much thanks um i'm peggy sands orchowski i um, a congressional correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook magazine. I've covered Congress for over 15 years, and I've written two books on immigration with a focus on, on how our immigration laws have evolved over, the, over history. And um, I just did a long interview in Spanish uh, with a young girl, a 26-year-old, who had walked from Ecuador to Texas in 45 days, walked across the river, and uh, was welcomed, got a bus to DC, and I and she's been here several weeks. Um, she the easiest part to come to easiest country to come through uh, the river and Texas. A border patrol officer helped her out, asked her how she was, took her to a registration center. She was asked two questions: What is your name? What is your nationality? Uh, she told me she's Venezuelan. I have to take her word for it. I asked her if she had papers. She was told not to bring any um, while she crossed over. And uh, she said immediately, and a man, I think it's USCIS, I'm not sure, from the ISAP, Intensive Supervision Appearance Program. I've never heard of that. Um, Immediately, she said several times, automaticamente, automaticamente, he gave everybody a claim and application for asylum. So once they got this automatic claim, they took, went to a tent city, got clothes, phones, three days later, was taken to a little town in Texas where she was immediately, they were told, you're free to go anywhere you want. And she said, um, she, with her application, the, some people were there to said, we we're putting a bus together to go to Washington, DC. And she said, great. And that's how she came here. Um, there question, are tens Peggy? of thousands of people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands who have not been vetted in any way. So I'm, I'm thrilled you have this new program. It sounds really good. But what are you going to do about the hundreds of thousands of people who have not been vetted, not asked one question about COVID or anything, of course? I, I don't know what the ISAP is. And I'm wondering about the Venezuelan. Um, she was a Venezuelan but lived in Ecuador for five years. 
so was not fleeing immediate prosecution or any kind. Okay, There's let's a give our temporary surface. Answer. So two questions, ISAP and Venezuelans, is it, does it matter how long they've lived elsewhere? Are they still given temporary protected status just on the basis of their nationality? So those are my two questions. Thank you, Peggy. Who would like to begin? <laughs> so, so maybe I can start. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to assess the specifics of this young woman uh, without you know talking more to her or, or or checking our systems and that kind of thing but i i would just push on one of the underlying pieces and premises of, of what you were what you were um relaying which is that these individuals who are processed at the border are done so without any screening or vetting at all that's it's just simply not the case um dhs takes fingerprints they run biometric checks, they, they run biographic checks, they do ask a series of questions. Um, and so to say that they're not vetted is just not accurate. So I, I just wanted to set the record straight there. Um, certainly, yeah, yeah. And and the other thing I would just share is you, you point out um, exactly actually what Sarah started the panel with, which is there are a variety of different pathways at this point with individuals who arrive at the border. Some people are um, expelled under Title 42. Some people claim asylum and they are processed under this, you know, phased implementation of this interim final rule. Others are processed under expedited removal. So there are different pathways. And so it sounds to me like this young woman was processed under one of those pathways. Um, well, and Jennifer, I can just jump in there because I, I think some of what that story illustrates is the confusion that immigrants experience going through the process. I, if you had called my office and asked me that question, I would say, stop, I need to talk to the person and only when she brings me her paperwork. Because I can almost guarantee you she probably has not been given an asylum form to fill out. ISAP is a monitoring company, it's not part of the government. Um, so the, I, they're not attorneys, they're not required to advise them how to pursue asylum laws in our country. Um, I, I suspect that there are things that she is confused about based on what you're telling me. And, and I can say that that would not, I'm, I'm saying that because of like years of experience, I've been doing this on the border since 2012. Almost, I, I've talked to people in detention, outside detention, I mean thousands of people, and it's very rare that someone's not confused about something. <laughs> so um, it, it just goes back to what you know, Philip and I were talking about. Talking to an attorney or you know, an accredited rep, someone who has experience in asylum law is crucial in individual cases. The other thing I wanted to just briefly mention as a bit of an aside, um, TPS, temporary protective status, is granted for 18 months periods of time. It's not permanent status in the country. So it's really, it, you could say it's a stopgap for certain circumstances, but it's really not a replacement of our asylum system. Uh, my understanding is that the designation date for Venezuela is passed, and she probably came subsequent to that, so she wouldn't be eligible. One of the big issues with TPS is and you know, you we saw this with Haiti, we see it with Venezuela, we see it with every country. You come one day after that designation date, you're in the exact same situation as a person who came a day before, and you don't have access to that form of temporary protection. Um, and we've been working on a letter to Congress on that specific issue. Um, but I'll just leave it there so we can take some more questions. Thank you so much. And there later this afternoon there will be a panel that among other subjects they'll be talking about TPS. So let me take a question from our virtual audience before we turn to uh, Reverend Ippolito. Um, how does the asylum backlog play into the deadlines that Professor Schrag is mentioning? So this is another, it's a clarifying question, right? It's to, people are confused by all this information. How can you help them understand that? Bill? These are the, the uh... I don't know what the question means by deadlines. Is he talking about the asylum application deadline? Or I think the, the de deadlines uh, in the interim final rule that you were describing and that Jennifer has described. That's my best guess. 
So what did you, you want me you, to take? Yeah, this? go ahead, take so, it. I, yeah, I, sure. So please. yeah, so certainly there is a, a large asylum backlog for individuals who, you know, were already in the United States applying for asylum. Um, so those cases are outside of the border context and in this interim final rule that we're we're discussing here. The one thing that I will say in it, that they are sort of interrelated is that. We have a finite amount of asylum officer staff. It's just the reality. And we're very grateful that we've received some appropriated positions. Uh, we are hopeful that we will uh, be able to get um, the request that is currently in the FY23 president's budget. Um, but the bottom line is there are going to be, it, it comes down to prioritization. You know, we have some appropriated positions to be able to focus solely on the backlog, but that's small in number and the backlog is large. Um, it's about comparable to what it was many years ago when it took us a decade to get through that backlog. Um, so in that sense, if we are prioritizing individuals arriving at our border, then th those resources are, are not being used to tackle our backlog. Uh, but there, they are two separate sh asylum streams. And that goes back to the whole, the whole process being rather confusing, given that there are so many different pathways. Thanks for clarifying that, Jennifer. And this is an old problem for those who are new to this system that the resources that the executive branch decides to use in one way or another affects another part of the system and the laws that Congress has created. But that's Congress's responsibility to fund, right? And I just add that this affects the immigration court system as well. Exactly. So to the extent that this new asylum merits interview process is denying or not granting asylum to people, they're going to immigration court. They have priority in the immigration court. What's that gonna to do to all the people who already have cases pending in the immigration court? It's gonna push them further back in the backlog, right? So instead of waiting four years, they may have to wait five years to have their cases heard. So and I to, like on the flip side of that, look at what the interim final rule will actually says, or, um, the idea is that 15% of those cases that would initially have gotten to the courts never will get to the courts because they'll be granted at the AMI stage. And so we just have to see how these numbers shake out. And it's going to take probably longer than six months. I would suspect it's going to take probably closer to nine months to a year before we're going to actually have a good number of stats on how the court system itself is affected by this process. You took the words right out of my mouth. And I was literally going to say, and on the flip side, um, we are, we are, keeping some cases from clogging up the immigration courts. And just one technical question about the transcript you raised, Jennifer. How has that worked so far? Has the transcript of the AMI actually been created in a timely way that it has been transmitted to the immigration courts? Great question. So um, this is actually one of the, the big successes was being able to so quickly leverage a contract to be able to get those transcription services. Um, and we are starting small. So most of those transcripts have been able to be provided within 30 days, which is the timeline. Um, but it is resource intensive and we are monitoring that very closely to make sure that they don't get prolonged because uh, we do think that as now that we've grown a little bit, we could start to see those timelines start to slip. So it's a great point. Thank you. Reverend Ippolito. Father Ippolito, uh, Catholic Charities Immigration Services in Houston. I'm a DOJ accredited rep. Um, thank you for bringing up the topic, Mrs. Higgins, of backlogs, because that's what my question is. USCIS has demonstrated they can fix backlogs. Uh, DACA renewals are now going anywhere from nine to 28 days. Uh, we made some great progress in U visa, work cards, four years. Congratulations. However, uh, you know, the rest of it is deep, deep in backlogs. I-90 renewals that should be a, a piece of cake. And I got one the other day in three weeks. But most of them are nine, 10, 11 months. These are, should be a, a no brain if somebody hasn't committed any crimes, you know? Um, yeah, 485s, my God. Citizenship, um, what can we do? What, what are we doing about backlogs? It's a great question. Our, our director, if she were here, would of course share that, um, getting through our backlogs is an absolute top priority for the agency. And we're really focused on people, process, technology, right? Those are the three things that are gonna help us 
get through the backlog. First, people. We already sort of touched on that where, you know, we, because of uh, a near furlough, a hiring freeze, um, ha it's been challenging to be able to have a fully functional workforce with all of our positions filled. Um, so we have been working very hard, anyone's interested, we're hiring, um, on, on filling those vacancies. Uh, with fantastic people. So that is a big focus, obviously, is, is filling our vacancies. Um, and in fact, we have a goal to try to do so and get to a 95% fill rate by the end of the, the calendar year. Um, it can't just be people though. You gotta look at process, right? Um, I've been working in the government since 1999 and we're really good at adding new things to the process. We're really bad at taking a bigger picture look to see what we can take away now that we've added something new. But our director is leading the charge in, in challenging the agency to do just that. Um, and so, you know, have, have already been putting in some, some, some new policies in place to be able to address some of these, these process issues and create some efficiencies, um, get rid of redundancies. And then the last thing is technology. And to me, this is probably one of the most exciting things that we're really working on. I mean, we were already, uh, sir, you mentioned I-90s. And, uh, you know, we're looking at how can we use technology and automation so that we can process cases in a timely way, especially those aspects of a case that don't require human discretion um, or really cutting down on handoffs, right? If you're digitizing files, if you're filing electronically, and of course not everybody can do that, but um, if you are, you cut down on, the, on snail mail and handoffs of cases to other offices that take time. So all that to say, I'm really excited about our director's vision in this regard, and we're already making some really good progress and laying that foundation this, this year. And I think you're going to start to see that bear fruit as we enter FY23. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, before we come back uh, to our uh, in-person audience, a question from our virtual audience. What can we do to deal with asylum seekers? I am not a lawyer. How can I help? What advocacy can be done? So would anybody like to take that question, Sarah? <laughs> uh, what I will say is I, I know I sped through my last few slides. Um, I understand that the conference organizers can make those available to folks who want to copy those. And I will include a link in there um, to our interim final rule processing page, which connects to the uh, official interim final rule in the Federal Register, as well as to our public comment that talks about you know, where we see um, potential issues with the interim final rule, um, as well as to the M444 form, which I think, Jennifer, you were alluding to, which is the advisal provided to individuals. My understanding is that currently it's being provided in English and Spanish and not other languages, but there's some resources there by other organizations as well um, that will hopefully help orient folks who want some more information. Um, and then, you know, specifically in, in terms of how to get involved, um, that depends a lot on your personal circumstances. Um, I can tell you with regards to doing requests for reconsiderations, we do not have Spanish translators um, who are regularly available to the degree that we need. And we've had people missing the seven day deadline because of lack of translation. Um, we've looked, we're running between like a week to two weeks to get things translated sometimes at our office. And um, if anyone has further questions for me, I'm staying for lunch, um, but also you can reach out to us at admin at migrantcenter.org. Um, if you want to be added to our newsletter when we do a final report, hopefully at the end of this year um, with some of these charts, when we have a few more data points um, and can draw some more conclusive um, conclusions, um, we're happy to add you to our newsletter list um, or otherwise communicate. So I hope that provides a little bit of information. I mean, I think there are like community groups that provide welcoming at Union Station or, you know, otherwise can assist in, um, with different services. So depending on where you live, your language skills, um, if opportunities need to be virtual or in person, that's really kind of I think, a personal question in many ways. Thanks so much, Sarah. Maggie, please. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Maggie Riley. I'm a policy analyst with Boundless Immigration in Seattle. And just thank you all, uh, all of the panelists who've been here today for being present. Um, and I just had a question. I am curious about the level of interagency communication and cooperation, um, especially in light of um, the interim final rule on asylum, which you've been discussing today, but also um, last week's DOJ rule that would allow attorneys to submit um, for limited representation in immigration courts. And I was sort of curious if there was an interest section there, um, given that we have um, expedited timelines now under the interim final rule, what was the level of agency coordination or were these sort of independently tracked um, ideas? It seems like they might dovetail together. So I was just curious um, if that was something anybody could speak to. Thank you, Maggie. An easy question for you, Jennifer. <laughs> Interagency cooperation. Well, so actually, I, I, it's, it's embarrassing a bit because I was remiss in, in touting that as I think one of the successes of the interim final rule, actually. Um, I actually think that the coordination among the agencies, um, not just in terms of creating the rule itself, but also how we're implementing it is, is, is working really well. Um, the fact that we're working so closely with ICE, CBP, OPLA, but also, as I said before, the NGO and practitioner communities, it's, it's um, I think, a, a nice model for that kind of collaboration and interaction. I can't actually speak to the DOJ rule um, myself, but I can tell you that um, our policy entities who usually manage the, you know, the rule process and, um, work very, very closely with their DOJ colleagues. In fact, have regular working group sessions and discussions with them on, on how to modify rules, what rules are going to be part of the primary agenda for the year, um, and which ones will be prioritized. But I think you raise a really interesting point, and it's something that I can, I can take back. Yeah, let me jump in there real quickly. On the EOIR um, rule, that's in response to the litigation in Mendez Rojas. Um, the, the DOJ issued a cease and desist order to the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project to not provide any form of assistance, basically, to pro se individuals. Um, and that was very quickly um, litigated for good reason. So this is the uh, result of intensive settlement negotiations between the parties um, represented by NERP. And um, I have not read it personally. I think there's some good parts to it and there's some parts that I'm not as happy about, but I think overall it's probably a pretty good movement forward. Um, I'm gonna have to push back a little bit on what you just said, Jennifer, with the stakeholder engagement. Um, the, there's a group of us who meet uh, at a kind of a national level on trying to track what's happening with implementation of the interim final rule. And there's been a lack of knowledge about certain pieces of the rollout that's been frustrating. Um, there's been multiple emails to USCIS requesting, for example, copies of certain documents that have taken weeks. Um, and in fact, I think in some situations we haven't even gotten, we haven't gotten response on some of our questions. Um, we are very much looking forward to today at 4 p.m. when USCIS has invited a group of us to stakeholders call to hopefully iron out some of these issues. Um, I have been asking USCIS Houston Asylum Office for a couple of weeks if they can take off our request in Spanish, and I have not gotten a response on that. So it's just, it's little things like that that can make a big difference in practice that hopefully we can iron out. I, I mean, another huge issue is the only way that I know of for people to submit these pro se is to snail mail, right? And so if there's a seven day deadline and there's snail mailing across half the state of Texas, which, you know, is like, a, it's gonna take four days to get their business days, right? Um, so, you know, why can't they scan an email? Why can't they provide access with a Dropbox where that can be sent by some officer? There's, there's a creative solutions to some of these issues um, that I think hopefully we'll be able to work out moving forward in engagement with the agency, um, but it has been a little bit slower than I think many of us were hoping for. The, the, one of the most important relationships between USCIS and the NGO community, I think, is in assistance to these migrants to obtain counsel. So it's wonderful that USCIS is providing people in the new AMI process with clear information about where to go for their hearings and when to go for their, uh, for their interviews and when, where and when to go for their interviews. But it would be the simplest thing in the world for them also to provide the official pro bono list of service provider, of legal services providers in the cities to which these people 
are going. They know the, a, the USCIS knows where they're going. That's the whole point of this rollout is they're selecting the cities to which the people are going. And in each of those cities, there is an immigration court official list of pro bono uh, 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 legal services providers. That list, as far as I can tell, is not being given along with the instructions on where and when to show up for the inter interviews. Is, is that correct? So there is uh, information for obtaining those services that's provided. Um, I think one of the questions was whether we could get some additional information translated. Um, there's also, I know that um, our, our other component colleagues have been able to pr set up phone hotlines and other things to be able to direct people into the right location. Having said that, um, there's still more that we can do. And so I think some of these ideas are are, are things that we're going to be taking stock of. And, and certainly, Sarah, I take your point. I think it's a matter of perspective. And it's not to say that by saying, I think that we've done um, a decent job of, do, of coordination means that there couldn't be more or more interaction. And we're really looking forward to that stakeholder engagement this afternoon. So we're almost out of time. So Im Imani, if you would ask your question, I apologize, but we're, I hope you can ask your question to our panelists afterwards. I appreciate that. But Imani, please go right ahead. Hi, Imani Cruz, a Migration Policy Advocacy Coordinator with American Friends Service Committee. Um, and we've talked a lot about how these asylum processing rules now uh, really affect immigration courts um, and how there's plans to expand it as well. Um, I'm kind of curious if there are thoughts on how this program um, will kind of affect the adjudication of immigration cases after Title 42 is ended. Um, I know there's not really, doesn't seem to be plans to do that anytime soon, but eventually it will be ended. So I just would love to hear any thoughts on that. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that. So uh, Title 42, of course, is a public health authority. Um, and uh, it, what if, if <laughs> when Title 42 uh, eventually goes away, we will see those individuals having to access different pathways, right? Title 42 is the public health authority and we defer to CDC on that. Um, but Title 8 is the authority for processing through expedited removal or other immigration pathways. So the individuals who are currently being expelled under Title 42 would move into a Title 8 immigration pathway. So that's sort of how they're, they're interrelated. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. So um, before I give you all instructions about lunch <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> when we'll come back together, I first want to uh, thank our panelists for an excellent discussion and presentation of information. There is a lot to take in. I hope you have a chance to meet with some of them afterwards. Jennifer has to run. We're really grateful that she changed her schedule to be here. But first, I'd like to thank our panelists for an excellent discussion. <laughs>